Oh, uh, yeah, I just want to get the spider to jump on that. Just make it a creative point to pay for this bit. It's going to be a shame. It's funny. It's going to be a Quentin Tarantino movie. Yeah. There's blood everywhere. But yeah. Like that. <laughs> so silly. This good. Yeah. You don't want to see Derek? Well, I'm trying to figure do you want to are you driving the presentation? Or yeah, just just tell me when you press. Yeah, that's okay. Uh my boss. How's it rolling? Oh, you want me to introduce? Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Rick Smith. I am director of GCRA, and we have brought together uh, for you tonight to discuss an ambassador program, potential ambassador program with Block by Block for downtown Gainesville. Uh, we are going through a negotiation right now with them uh, on a sole source procurement, and we're reaching out to stakeholders such as yourself, um, and the police department and Gainesville Fire and Rescue to get an idea of the services you want and need that we can include in the contract. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Derek Hughes with Block by Block, and he'll give you an overview of his uh, company. We can begin asking questions. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for letting this drama suspense by trying to get this presentation to work. Uh, but first of all, I just want to thank a lot of people in this room. This, I've been here for about 24 hours now, and Gainesville has been extremely hospitable uh, to me and accessible just to, to ask questions. I was able to spend some time with the fire department and the police department, and of course, Andrew and uh, Frank here. So just thank you, everybody, from uh, Gainesville. Uh, um, so my style, like, I'm, I'm not like, I don't like to do like long, drawn out presentations. So if you have questions, please do jump in. But I do want to give you just a brief overview about who we are and like why I'm here um, talking to you. Um, so with that, I'll just go over uh, some information about us at Block by Block. I am Derek Hughes, I'm the Vice President of Block by Block. Uh, and I've been doing this for about 21 years. Uh, public space management is what we call it. So it's anything you can think of to make the public space better uh, for business, for visitors, for residents, and, or anybody who kind of experiences the, the public space, so that's kind of what we do. Uh, and I love it because of the variety in that. So um, anyway, that's who I am. Let me tell you a little bit about our story. If you want to click twice. Um, so we were actually founded out of Louisville, Kentucky. So that's where I live now uh, from an event management company. And we, we got our, we cut our teeth at a little place called Churchill Downs. You might've seen them on the news a few weeks ago, uh, it was a horse race. Um, but the thing that kind of separated us apart in that space was it was always about hospitality first, like the experience that we gave people. And I wasn't around back then, but even when I joined the company 21 years ago, it was all about the experience we get more than the tasks that we could perform. So yeah, we pick up litter and we give directions and we help the unhoused, but really we want to do that with the air of hospitality and that kind of, you know, that that's in our services all of them today. We can advance the next one. So um, we kind of started this downtown thing in 1995. We were doing a security company business, all the class A businesses in our buildings in downtown. Uh, and they approached us. They had just formed their first business improvement district, if you're familiar with what those are. And they were like, hey, can you kind of do what we're doing in the building, put that on the street, and it'll be great. And we're like, why not? We'll, we'll try it out. And then we did that. And then um, just a few years after that, we abandoned the security company altogether because we're having so much more fun in downtowns. Uh, and that's about when I joined the company as well. We're a privately held company. Uh, we have a holdings company out of Nashville. That doesn't mean too much to you guys, except we have really strong financial backing. So a lot of times what we need like to you know, capitalize equipment for our customers and whatnot, we have the ability to do that. 
But currently, we operate about 175 different locations across the country. It's like, you know, sometimes we have multiple programs in one city. For example, in San Francisco, we have like 15 programs, uh, but we represent 175 different organizations. Uh, and our core competency is more than just the sum of the parts. Like I said, it's really about the experiences that we create for people. Um, the other cool thing about us is we have a 96% customer retention rate, which means it, you know, it kind of reinforces their bad habits. It kind of reinforces them because people kind of keep us around. Next slide. So if you just want to get a kind of a, a breadth of where we work, um, you know, we, we pretty much span the, the country. We're in 42 different states. Um, however, in Florida, we are to do a couple of different operations. So Jacksonville being the closest. Uh, we do downtown Jacksonville, where we have a, a pretty robust team there of about 45 ambassadors on the streets uh, throughout seven days. We Port City and, and Tampa. We're actually talking with Dan, downtown Tampa now. And then we do a bunch of stuff in South Florida to um, start with Hollywood Beach and then several neighborhoods in Miami. So none of this can be supported if we don't heavily invest in our infrastructure. And you'll see that on the next slide. Um, where this is an org chart, and I'm not going to go over the boring org chart for the company, but I just want to kind of underscore that everyone you see here is dedicated to field support. This isn't AP, AR, IT, HR. These people that you see on the screen are 100% dedicated to once you get a program set up to make sure that's successful. So technology, um, which I'll talk more about in a second, uh, is baked in here. Um, all of our operating guidelines baked in here, our training, you know, the things that we can do to support our managers are all part of this work chart. And, and the most of them work in my office in Louisville, but the center section right here, uh, where you see John Cook and Leola and Jake, those are all people that we dedicated to the region that you guys would exist in. So they can support our Florida markets. And so we have a team of like one, two, three, four, you know, four managers who would support your local manager here. So I think that that's one of the reasons why we've been uh, successful over the years. Next slide. Um, all right, so let's talk about like the, the the foundation of what we do outside of hospitality, um, and that's cleaning, safety, special projects, and how. And so, you know, cleaning, we do a, a myriad of things from litter collection to graffiti, pressure washing, special projects like cleaning plus. This is where we're painting, uh, you know, laying mulch and like doing event support, things like that. But I think what we're really here to talk about today is our work in public safety. Uh, and then the social outreach realm. Um, and so, you know, our, our approach to those, again, the hospitality is at the forefront. Uh, even in our social service models, we want to create inclusive environments for people. This isn't about kind of dividing, you know, the population groups up. It's like, how do we all like kind of live together and, and you know, co function with our, with our interests? In. And so that's a theme that you will have, you know, throughout our work. Um, from the safety part, that includes hospitality for us. That's really the business engagement. So the Skill Downtown Group is very cool because it's comprised of business owners who are invested in downtown. Uh, and we really want to make sure that you guys have you know, the, the, the best chance to run a successful business at the, at the street level. So we spend a lot of time with business engagement, um, you know, frontline support of their staff, um, and then the security aspect, uh, elements, safety escorts, things like that. Uh, on the social outreach front, I'll, I'll dig into these just a little bit more in just a second, but we're a resource navigator, but we're really not, we're not a case management system. And one of the cool things about Gainesville that I've seen is I went to Grace today, which is amazing. We have resources like that. I met Mark, who is their um, kind of head outreach guy who, you know, had this mobile band doing great work, face work right there um, on, on campus. I uh, also met with the fire department who has their own CPR team uh, that was amazing, the things that they're doing. And so we're not looking to replace any of that. We're looking to, you know, how we can we work with them uh, and, and be a resource navigator to people that we encounter or an advocate. Uh, one of the good things about these programs is you're in the space a lot more than race could be because they're, you know, they're going all over the city or the county even. Uh, but, you know, we'd be having to find a footprint every day. So our opportunity to build relationships and then help, help leverage these systems, um, that's really where we find success. Um, we have a trauma-informed model, um, which uh, if you're familiar with open outreach, um, you're familiar with it, but if not, uh, we, we want to make sure that we're, not, we're, we're safeguarding against, you know, behavior issues that uh, can lead to trauma with people. We're very much trained in de-escalation. Um, and then, you know, we focus on all areas. We're not just really like combined, you know, veterans or women with children or 
you know, you have a dog, like we can really kind of advocate for anybody in the space. So next slide, and we'll go through these pretty quick. Um, so our safety elements, um, we do a couple of different things. And this slide really represents like almost like two different looks. And I think it starts with the aesthetics of the program, how you want to present yourself. So on one hand, uh, the yellow shirt and the, and the sun hat, this is our uh, a program in San Antonio, which is very hospitality driven. We do safety work too, we can still observe and report, but the public, these are hospitality people uh, working on the river walk. This, on the other hand, in West Hollywood, that very much looks like a security team. And that's a bike team that patrols the city of West Hollywood. We, we actually patrol the entire city there. And so one of the conversations that we want to have as we kind of get in kind of the weeds of this program formation is like, who do you want to be as a brand with your, with your programming? We'll help guide that. Next slide. Uh, again, these are just a couple of examples of uh, how that can manifest uh, for the security look versus hospitality. We can keep going. Um, you know, and regardless of the program, uh, we want to position visible services. And so sometimes we add things like this is an info card that we use. Those are all QR codes. If you want to like you know where the best place for loud music, the best place for you know to get a steak. Um, but we use these as a, an opportunity to set up shop and quarters, particularly busy, uh, and we can get the most bang for the buck on the program from a visibility standpoint. And go next. Um, this is another example of different things we use info cards, feather flags, you have a large event or something like that. We you can really see our services from down the street, which is important if you're kind of walking past something that makes you nervous and you're like, okay, I see somebody down the street and I'm not too far away from safety. Next slide. Um, again, these are just more pictures of our safety programs. Um, I think that the, the key. With all of this, you want to create services that are visible to the public. You want to get credit for your investment, and you want to make sure that the most people um, can kind of experience that. So, you know, one of the things I'm doing on this trip is, you know, riding along with police officers tonight at you know one in the morning. And so, one of the things that I'm going to get from that, I want, I want to give context to what's happening in Gainesville, but I'm also like, is that the best use of the investment to put? services out that late at night when those are police issues. I'll, I'll find out more tonight, but these are conversations that we'll want to have. But I think the most important part of any kind of ambassador program is getting it in front of the most people you can. So that, you know, if it's busier between 10 a.m. and 8 p.m., that's where you really want your services. Um, we do a lot of branding uh, on equipment too. Um, and this is kind of a, the fun part about this. And we can talk about you know, do we want to deploy Narcan? I was like, yes. Do we want to, like, you know, do certain things with the, the unhoused population? But as soon as we talk, start talking about branding, everybody wants a committee. Everyone wants a mm -hmm. team involved. So I'm going to ask you guys in advance when we get there, just make it easy on me to put a cool brand out there. Uh, you can keep going. These are just more examples. The other thing, too, I think is really important is um, creating a good message around this. Um, and starting with the outcomes in mind, like what you want out of this program. And coming up with a mission statement around the services themselves. I think the marketing team can help with that uh, and develop collateral material. I think that people are going to be like, you know, what are these ambassadors on the street? What do they do? So I think week one, you want to go out and kind of flood the, you know, flood the businesses, make introductions. How can you get all of us? Here's our operating hours. Here's what we do. So that will be an important component of that. And here's some just examples of different things that we've put together. Um, and this is really safety programs. They don't work great if you don't have the partnerships. Um, and so starting my trip off, like meeting people from the city and the community that are gonna be critical to the success of this is really indicative of like um, thinking about this the right way. So again, thank you guys for setting that up because I think it's a total smart way to do it. Because um, if we don't have the support of PD, social outreach, fire, or public works, or the city manager, or any of that kind of stuff, it's hard to really have a successful program. So that'll be key. Uh, and making sure that this uh, is working properly. Um, and then I think this is the last safety slide, and I, I don't necessarily recommend this for Gainesville, but we are getting more involved in dispatch, real crime time center, or crime centers, uh, what we can do with cameras. And so as the program evolves, it might be something that we, that we want to look at. Um, you can keep going. All right, let's talk about social outreach. Um, and again, I, I kind of touched on a lot of this uh, in the intro. Um, 
But we have a couple of different models that we can, we can look at. One of them is where we have somebody on our team that's a dedicated, licensed social worker. Like they went to school in the state, very much educationally trained to do social outreach. And then they're either, they either work by themselves or with a partner within a team that does more like the public safety hospitality work, or they have a team of, um, let's say, less trained people, less educated people, I should say, uh, that, that support them. Um, the other model is where you just have a team, as many as possible, that we train, you know, in our systems for social outreach and, um, you know, and just in speaking with the, the, the people of Grace, they would love to be, you know, um, partners with us in training and whatnot. We can train them all uh, to really kind of focus on this kind of work. So that's another thing that is I'm kind of, you know, making my observations that I'll be recommending one model versus the other. Um, you know, again, we're tour guides, I would say, of the social service networks. And once we learn everything, we can really advocate for people. This is sometimes a slow game, right? Like sometimes people just are service resistant. Um, and so, you know, every day we'll make these contacts with people, uh, you know, educate them about the systems that are available. Um, you know, I think the, one of the things that we're really good at, uh, this comes from that foundation of hospitality, is making these relationships. Like, we're, we're going to talk, we can cuss us out one day, we're still going to come back and be like, hey, what's going on today, Rick? You're ready to get into the spray. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's just a, a constant game to do that. So you have to be a little bit uh, tenacious and consistent. Uh, we do have. Uh, we have uh, been successful in getting the HMIS uh, access in our markets. Uh, and talking with uh, Assistant Chief Sutton today, that's not something the city is currently doing, but I think Grace is. And so they're trying to figure out like you know, how, how to make the reporting better. Uh, and that's basically the system. It's called Homeless Management Information Systems that uh, a lot of social providers uh, use. Uh, and then we have a plan and guidelines. So we don't have to reinvent this. We're not going to come in like trying to figure things out. Like we've been doing this in a number of cities. So um, we can come up with a very good baseline and, and plug in the locality, um, you know, expertise on top of that. These are some other things we've done through marketing. Um, I'm not necessarily suggesting that, but these are just some of the things we've done where we can put donation boxes around town. We can start putting campaigns around other ways to give. Sometimes these are controversial. Sometimes people feel like it's, you know, you're advocating against the unhealthy population. So, but it's something we can talk about if you're interested in what's been successful in other cities. And then, um, you know, talking about the encampment front, which is, you know, I saw where like there was, uh, I think it was on Fourth Street, uh, right around St. Francis, where there was a recent encampment that's currently fenced off. Um, but we're experienced and kind of going into their surveying them, even help cleaning them up, doing a lot of the communication. If you are going to have like something like, you know, they were doing the landscaping. And so, you know, we can come in and do a lot of that messaging in the encampment before that, those displacements happen. Um, and unfortunately, that's something that we've gotten uh, a lot of experience doing. Any questions so far about like the models or the services that we provide? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I have a I have a few inter or a few different questions, kind of a few thoughts about this. I mean, it seems seems to me it's right on board with what but like a lot of the business owners that we're talking about, the kind of things we've been looking for, and what we consistently hear as far as priorities for um, safety and security. And um, sounds like it might be a really interesting fit. Um, I guess the, the, one of the things that always pops up in my mind with things like this is. Um, Sounds like you've had a lot of success with this. What um, can you tell us a story about some of the failures you might have had, and like how that works, and like what kind of things you know might contribute to that type of stuff? Well, yeah, and there's a, there's a couple of failure points you should just be aware of, right? Like mm -hmm. one of them is private coordination. Like that, that's what I was talking about. We just drop a program in the street. You know, people aren't involved or you know in support of it. Like for instance, if we didn't engage police department at all. We just drop ambassadors on the street and they start messing around and forcing and calling the police about things. That's not going to go well if you don't have like a lot of planning uh, and conversations in advance. Um, so that's number one, I think, is like the coordination and communication needs to be kind of flushed out uh, and everyone kind of at least have an understanding about what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing for the businesses too. Like this isn't a silver bullet. Like, 
who's going to be ambassador there. And, you know, you have somebody in your place of business that is, you know, just ran out on their bill. Um, you know, we're not going to untie them uh, and bring them back to you and like shake them down for the money. And so um, there's that kind of disconnect sometimes too, where like business is like, wait a minute, like I'll tell you, how many years my private security is not really that. Uh, this is public space kind of experience management. Sure, we'll, we'll help the businesses and we're going to respond uh, in a way much faster than most law enforcement uh, operations can, especially for like quality of life stuff. But it's sometimes like, you know, people think that it's going to be like my own personal private ambassador to force anything I need in my store, loss prevention, have a problem with an employee that like, you know, mm -hmm. it's not really designed to do that. Okay. Um, other failure points. I mean, I think the most critical, and I didn't even mention this, our business model is we hire a local manager here that will be here every day to point of contact. We build a team around that manager and that, that you know, they're, they're, they're our boots on the ground. Um, and they're your point of contact locally. That's the most important position in our company. It's not me, it's not the president, it's not even the frontline ambassadors. Because if that doesn't work, like the model doesn't work. And so there's been a couple of times where out of the gates, we've hired the wrong person. They interview really well, we hire them for super stoked, uh, and then they don't work out, and then we have issues. But uh, that org chart I showed you is designed to be able to handle things like that and come in quickly. And, I would say that's probably the biggest uh, pain point for us is the local manager and who that will end up being. What's the ideal characteristic of that manager that's successful? So I think somebody who's like super resourceful and um, it, it can be fluid. If you work in public spaces, uh, not confined ones. Uh, and so therefore it's really hard to dictate everything that's gonna happen. And some people get freaked out by that. Some people are like, whoa, wait a minute, like what I need to know exactly what the manual says for the day it happens, you know, I do P. And that's not what kind of job this is. And so people who are very rigid and you know regimented and like a structure system, uh, a lot of times get stressed out in a job like this. And so I think we want to look for people who have experience dealing with like kind of juggle a lot of balls and like you know, leading a team and you know keeping them motivated because it can change on a daily basis. Is this uh, is this somebody you look for, you know, out of the community or find from, you know, somewhere else that may have, you know, better experience with it? So we, we typically do hire from the communities. Uh, now we post every job internally. Uh, and if somebody wanted to transfer in, absolutely. Um, so, but a lot of times we hire somebody local who's really uh, takes a lot of pride in their community and they want to, be part of something bigger and um then we can kind of teach them all the all the secret sauce cool. um so well i'm gonna i'm gonna keep it with what my opposite would like me to say and so eight weeks is ideal um we can do it we can do it a little faster than that though we need to provide it like a, you know i think one of the big barriers um to, to scaling uh is the brand stuff that I talked about. So we're gonna go through a lot of debate about colors and logo and placement and things like that. It can really, there's other things that those decisions impact like uniforms and you know vehicle wraps and things like that. So it just kind of relates the pipeline. Uh, and then also space, like uh, identifying office space. Um, listen, some of our New York City, some of our operations center say rubber made on the outset. So we're not picky. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we will need to identify some sort of space to build it. You have a separate group to clean and a separate group for a safe, or do they get cross trained? Everybody's cross trained. So, this is, you know, it's kind of like I manage my house. Like, I don't care if your brother took your socks down, they came up, people walk by, and like, so it's kind of like that. Like, um, so they're trained a little differently. Um, safety teams, um, they get a little bit extra training on, like, you know, the de escalation. And, the engagement piece and cleaners get a little bit extra training on like bloodborne pathogens and whatnot, but in terms of like litter, um, basic things like that, everyone's expected to pick it up. And just like everyone's expected, if you look lost at the parking meter or something like that, we should be able to help you. What kind of equipment do the security folk have? So typically, I mean, we've used like two way communications, um, used to be radios, but I'm like um, kind of evolved to relays lately. They're I don't want to get into about that, but they're they're not dependent upon like having a, a dedicated repeater. Uh, so radios, uh, we have first aid, uh, you know, kits on us, uh, CPR masks. We carry Narcan 
Uh, if you, that's what we want to do, we have the ability to do that, and we can even do body cams, uh, which I've found um, to be really helpful, not only from an accountability standpoint of both parties, uh, but just like they say, you know, pictures speak a thousand words, videos speak even louder than that. And so if you're really kind of having repeat, you know, instances of behavior with certain somebody's and you can have video evidence for it, a lot of times that's missing in the court, it can really kind of help. What's the toughest city you're in right now? For safety? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we're in Oakland, California, we're in Missouri, we're in uh, Kentucky, between uh, Los Angeles, Hollywood is tough. You know, I think that, uh, I mean, Jacksonville's got some, you know, some, some tough outcomes. What well, kind of terrible in terms of somebody starts and how long do you have them before they are out? So what was the experience there? So we actually track uh, quick quits is what we call it. I can barely say it, but about quick quits. And this is where, um, you know, we track somebody who's like, are they leaving before the 30 days or uh, uh, that happens on startups more than anywhere else. So I would anticipate the brand new program will transition half to staff in many cases, probably. But once you really kind of get that baseline pool of people, then you can start really uh, building upon that to the point of we don't even, we, we track turnover, but that's not what we focus on. We focus on retention. And so the number that we're really trying to get to is 70% retention of people who have been here two years or more. Um, because then you can always, your level, you're always going to have some turnover. If you have a good solid core of 50, 60, 70 percent of the people who are here and they're invested, it's easy to kind of absorb that turnover and still have a stand up team around. If that makes sense. So, based on the footprint that we have, this is just from the GCRA, right? Just downtown. Just downtown. Just downtown. Uh, essentially, University Avenue to Midtown. Five cities? Mm -hmm. No. EV ones, so just the just the for that turnover reason. Make sure it's easy to balance. I hear it. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. right. And, and probably patrol vehicle too. I mean, I, it's all budget related, right? right? So, like, so you know, the vehicle that would make sense, like cut it out. That would be a way to get from midtown to downtown, being super visible with the strobes and the you know the lights, and the branding, um, and we capitalize all that. But I mean, we basically would be interest free loans on that. So we try to make the investment as possible. So we were in Miami a couple of days ago and of course the downtown development authority who said they had 30 folk and of course clean and securing even the landscaping and stuff. I mean it, it was cool. Um I don't know what do you think? They were happy. They were happy. They were happy and they uh, and I think every one of their client or their ambassadors had uh, been homeless at some point. Yeah. So that's that's that for sure. So that's the other thing that we want to talk about because we've had a couple commissioner talk about giving a, a homeless population uh, an opportunity. Right? Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Go to Grace and that a vote to work for us or so it's funny actually with that Grace today and that came up. And so we do that, like this lived in experience and second chance programming, workforce development programming, all of those things. Yeah, I think it's helping them to build a business. Yeah, I think it's a, I think yeah. it's a powerful thing. Uh, so you do that so you know how to do it. Would you start with Grace? Would you start with Bell Central Florida Workforce? Or how do you get to the population to make sure they're trained and, and ready to be in the workforce? So what I want to, I want to get to know all the members for sure. And I would definitely look for advice from people who have been in this community for a long time that we might have you guys for introductions. The other thing too is like I think that like when you're looking at like a lot of the, the, the population you're talking about Miami for instance they do the clean services but not necessarily do the safety mm -hmm. part. I'm not saying that it can't be done. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think for something like this where you're looking for you know a proof of efficacy in the program that's going to be sustainable things like that I would probably start out Hiring a really solid team, like again, people who um, get the work, um, can be professional, build those relationships, and then start working on integrating it uh, with some of the people from the, that community uh, on a safety program out of the gates. Now, we've had much success doing that. It adds like this a really healthy layer of legitimacy to like the, the rest of the population on the street. And they think, oh, I, I used to, I used to be in a camera with that guy. I saw the guy. I look at him. How he's doing now? He does another great stories to tell, and we want to be part of that. But with us coming in and not knowing the space, I would want to make sure that 
the initial team that we're building, where all eyes are going to be on the program, but we have the best chance to be successful as possible. So, um, you know, 90 days or something like that, and you know, the community get to learn us, we get to know the community and what they're doing, and we can start talking about, you know, workforce entry programs. That's what I would recommend. So I'd like to hear from the businesses how you all want to see this whole distinction. I mean, I think it's an interesting start. Um, I, I guess I still have a couple more questions on, you know, maybe what, what do we look at as far as, you know, you mentioned efficacy and how does this, this work? I mean, how do, how do we as businesses, other than just kind of seeing somebody out there, um, how do we know this is working? How do we, how do we measure this? Sure. How do we report? Can hit the next slide for me? So one of the things that we are is we're very data driven. Uh, and we have a proprietary system called the SMART system. Um, and that's what we use to um, kind of put in every information that we want to about the program. This is the other important element about the startup is like, what's the story we want to tell a year from now? If you're standing on you know, a stage at some annual meeting and you want to talk about the success of this program, what are you looking to say? Um, you know, and then we build a data set around it, and that's what we report into. And so we'll go over this. We can send these reports out to you, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, usually monthly, quarterly reports are good. Um, but, you know, we, we'll track everything, the number of businesses that we're uh, interacting with, the feedback we're getting from them. Uh, we will track, um, you know, the, the people who refer to services, how many people went to services. Um, you know, how many people we were able to help at the street level, just with simple stuff, directions, restaurant recommendations, things like that. Um, you know, we'll track how many times we had to call the police or EMS or dial that one one. We can even track the response time uh, of what, you know, those calls uh, would generate. Um, again, before we start tracking how long it took people to show up, I'd want to coordinate and for people to understand what we're doing. But uh, mm -hmm. I think a lot of those things can speak to the success of the program. And then you can overlay that, like take a real point in time kind of like crime stats in downtown. I'm, I'm assuming uh, the chief lawyer probably has access to some sort of crime stats downtown. And then we can compare them, you know, you know, in the quarters that move on beyond that, have they improved, have they not? Um, you know, the number of people sleeping in downtown sidewalks, the point in time counts down, are they not? Mm -hmm. um, those are to all of those things that would kind of, you know, provide a, a, a snapshot of the program successfully. You're, you're also able to track the track of the ambassadors throughout yeah. downtown. That's what this is. Too. So we really want to make sure we're doing the coverage area. And if you go to the next slide, we'll see this is the video of like the way our system works. Um, so this is imagine the ambassador in your street. So our system has a GPS mechanism on it. He's so taking that thing around like a weapon. He is, he is. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Cross training. Cross training. Cross training. Cross training. That's good. That's <laughs> good. Well, you're talking about because that turns into a walk path where you can see really where they're out in the maps. Uh, you get GPS coordinates on it. Or, you know, this will also, if we're responding to the same thing every day, it will create heat maps for us. So you can see the pocket of activity is in a certain area, a certain business, a certain alley. Um, it'll, it'll show up that way on the map. So it's a really powerful tool that we can use, um, not only for our own management, but to share the information with other people who will be helping us. I was uh, my, my my personal preference in, uh, for optics would be the the bright shirt, yeah, uh, nice, the nice, yeah. super hospitality, but with the the obvious option that they can call something in. And so, there, from my experience of our our patrons, um, that there's oftentimes where it'd just be nice to see to know somebody's close by. When they're getting ready to pass by somebody that's caused issues and assaulted people or just out of jail again, just to see somebody downtown, like that's a huge win. So we have people that love our downtown that, you know, if they've been assaulted, spit on, pushed by another person that's in and out of incarceration, it, it's just hard for them to do repeat, right? And so like, and it's both disheartening because we want our downtown to be safe, and then it's disheartening because hospitality folks like us, restaurants and bars, we're all, well, I think most of us are hanging on by a thread. So really having something like this has been talked about for a while. So I'm really excited about it. Optic wise, um, so yeah, that, the, the Barney Five kind of 
feeling. I want to. I would like to know how um, you train for that that hospitality side, because that, in my experience, that's not something you really learn. It's something you are. If you're a friendly person that can be excited about helping people explore a downtown, so how do how do you how do you vet and do that, or is that something you just try to like? We just you more know, body that. trained to be hospitable, or no, 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 no. you kind of nail the head like. Uh, <laughs> We have a process where we interview people that um, we call them podium interviews. Where it's almost like a casting call. If you imagine like American Idol or something like this. People show up a little like this. You go over the spiel about the job, and then we move into speed dating rounds. Where like you know we'll have somebody out here. We have individual one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. Uh, and what we're really looking for is friendly people, eye contact, smiles. I can talk to you very easily because I cannot train people to be nice or not. To train people, you know, where the businesses are downtown or how we respond to somebody who said they got their friends looking into or something like that. I but I but I can't train people to be nice necessarily. And so we we hire for personality and we train for skill. That's something that's uh, foundational for us. And it goes all the way back to that original slide where I was talking about the hospitality piece. Um and then on top of that, we have a ton of training. Uh, that we do each, you know, we do 32 hours of like classroom training. There's a scavenger hunt that we'll build just about whatever the, the geographical footprint ends up being. And like, you know, I was out and about last night. So one of the things I thought was funny, there was like this, it was like a heavy metal live band that was playing, but there was all these like these regular like people that looked like, like a room like this is outside having beers with like death metal playing. So one of the things I would put on there is like, where could you go listen to death metal on a Wednesday night with scavenger hunt? They have to go find it. Um, you know, where is there a bar with an arcade attached to it? Like, you know, those types of things. Um, so we teach them about the downtown. Uh, we go so far as like, we have a five part series about just, you know, how to make a good engagement. Those over it had a properly good, you know, directions. Don't be vague. Don't go like, hey, just go oh, it's about 200 yards that way, and I think you turn around. Like, have specifically give a our directions. We teach that, but it's all about finding the people who are willing to take that training and really put it like a different way naturally. Um, well, let me ask that you sort of bring up another thing that I think has come up a few times with the downtown business owners is is we. We've kind of identified that need for more wayfinding. Um, a lot of people have come back and said, "Hey, we, you know, we just don't know where we're supposed to park or these kind of things." And so, I guess the question would be maybe maybe going towards the city is, you know, whether or not these type of funds, you know, whether we're looking at this as a replacement for more wayfinding or um, something like that. But I do think that would be, a, you know, I mean, to me, if we have this plus some really good signs that say park right here kind of thing we i think we could really start to see more activation downtown um well and, yeah so i guess i'd just ask that if it's so, so consideration oh, or you go ahead okay well i mean that's part of the uh, uh downtown strategic plan capital improvement suggestions cool and uh, you know and it's uh it's going to be a budgetary issue Mm -hmm. One of the reasons we stood up a downtown advisory board is we're going to have to weigh priorities. Mm -hmm. um, do we invest in capital improvements? Do we invest in operations, events, ambassadors? Mm -hmm. And um, getting more stakeholder engagement with the DAB will be very important to determining those priorities and how we invest. Because we only have about 12, 12.2 million um, over the life of the downtown plan and mm -hmm. that ends in 2029. So we're going to have to hus <clears throat> husband the, the budget mm -hmm. accordingly. Yeah, so there is some, you you know, there is a downtown advisory board that's going to be mm -hmm. wrapping up at some point. And don't know what that's going to feel like because the membership obviously, you know, hasn't been identified yet. But they'll have a role. Uh, and right now, um, just putting it out there, there is a friction between certain businesses because of a noise issue. I was in, you know, Miami, I've been there most of my professional life. I was downtown at a high end hell. I was up on the 11th floor and I still run the Elvis. And, you know, they put some earphones in the room and you stick them in if you don't want to hear it, right? So, oh, are our guys and ladies going to be stuck in the middle of that? Do you think? Have you had that situation occur? 
where yeah, folks absolutely. think that they are supposed to go and tell somebody to turn their music down because I'm just I'm just interested. No, in that does happen. Interested in what you uh, and so what's the deal with that? Well, I think that like listen, I think when we write the scope of service, like we'll, we'll discuss what's important. We want it to be in there. So if you want to support it, it's education as part of it, then it can be part of it. Um, you know, what I would advise people to be mindful of though, it's like putting things in the scope that are targeting certain groups of people. Like you don't ever want to do that because then it's just gonna really kind of you know backfire. So it has to be what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And so when this comes out here, it should be subject to everybody. Mm -hmm. Um you know, but I, I'll give you an example of Santa Monica. Um, you know, we we educate and provide information as it relates to their street performers in the, in the front. Part of that is a decibel meter because you're only supposed to be at a certain amount of decibels. Right. You have to be this many feet apart from another performer. Sometimes they fight over turf wars because certain blocks are better than others. And so we get in the middle of all that. Mm -hmm. But it's part of the job. So it becomes part of our training. It's like, do you help support and develop programs? I mean, because you know that's something Gainesville really likes is the idea of arts and culture here. And you know, if we had, you know, maybe some guidance or leadership on managing a, a, that type of performance program, that might still continue to draw people back. It's funny how my role specifically has evolved over the years, um, which probably kind of keeps me going. Anyway, I end up being like a consultant, kind of like in house for for customers. Um, and so best practice sharing is a big part of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and even if, um, you know, we're not coming in like, here's your management plan, we're not definitely connecting you to other people or talking about our own experiences. And then based upon that, there's, we've stood up a number of things within a program that are beyond clean and safe, if you will. Mm -hmm. Like I used to, in, in Los, I used to live in Los Angeles, and so one of our customers started a music festival, the Sunset Strip Music Festival, and ended up being part of the production team by default to an ambassador program. Like, so I mean, it can it can evolve in crazy ways. Is there um, a way for uh, feedback, whether good or bad, for the ambassadors? By I guess it would be mostly business owners, or maybe maybe yes, or, yeah, okay. uh, yes, there is. So we could do that a couple different ways through our smart system that I showed you earlier. Um, if, if this would have like a dedicated website to downtown or something like that, we can scan it where it would be like your brand looking, but it's a feedback center that we can do. We'll power it through our own IT stuff, uh, and that can be consolidated against you know, you can go to the toll or the executive committee or whoever's going to be the point of contact with this program. So we can do it that way. Now, uh, one of the things that's another thing we have a training on, though, is like how to get feedback. We want people to get feedback. So we create one of the things the pandemic uh, did is uh, really make QR codes good again. Our cool again. And so we use them for everything. And so, you know, we'll, you'll see a QR code on the vehicle, on the bicycle, on the, you know, whatever stuff we have that people can scan. And that's a direct form for feedback. So can you, well, I'm sorry. Oh, that's right. We do this. Is it in my town? It got yeah. So Butler Plaza, can you go and check it out and just kind of give us a feel for that? Because we, we're not trying to compete, but we also want to be a player. Right? Okay. So if you could, while you're here, go sure. over and take a look and see what you see and go bring some stuff back. Sure. Yeah. Um, what about an option of, you mentioned, oh, sorry, um, <laughs> <laughs> you you do you ever do, um, like awards for friendliest and most, like just to have a, a way to yeah. highlight. And so culture, um, we have a whole department called Culture Club with a director that oversees that, uh, that was part of the org chart up here, where we do all kinds of fun group exercises. Like we just got done with the natural ambassador uh, um, annual kickoff, summer kickoff, where we have a group of like this natural, natural average ambassadors and we'll theme up it. Um, we did a derby thing. Um, but we also have built-in local rewards. So we have um, a, a pretty good budget for like gift cards and things like that for condos to write. Like, hey, you really did a good job handling that situation with a crazy rock climbing guy. I like, appreciate you. I'm just kidding. But, but um, um, and so we have that. We do employee of the month. We do employee of the year. Uh, we do service awards. Um, and so that's something that's really incredibly important uh, who we are uh, that we can recognize our people. Mm -hmm.
I got one more for you. From Villanova. If your investors see, <laughs> if your investors see like a broken light or a sidewalk that needs to be pressure washed, is that something we can Absolutely. report to our cities? Like yeah. so, mm -hmm. someone else can get on it. So we can report the three one one. Also, in the smart system, uh, there's a maintenance request module that you can. The reason why I like it in our system is because time they stamp it and also put a geotag on it. Uh, and you can put pictures. And so we can make that go to the right department. Right. And then that can automatically. So we can set up an advance to want it to go to three one one or automatically generate the email to go there. Uh, and then if it's an art system, we can follow up too when it's been repaired or fixed and we can yeah. mark it as close. Does it include like, I think this road would look a lot better if it was like raked or the leaves were blown off it or like how specific? Um, they get, like, we, we could, yeah, sure, sure yeah. we can document cleaning issues or debris issues. And uh, we do that all the time when we're managing our most aspects of the program because we'll make work orders for ourselves too. Like, you know, somebody will be on patrol and be like, hey, somebody did illegal dumping in the alley. And the safety master didn't really have the tools to deal with right then. So they put her system and it goes to the clean team side. So, yeah, we can do that. And how do you so, figure out the events that are happening in the city? So, like, the community, there's a bunch of people who love to communicate, like, some good event, events calendars here. So, we can get the CVP, then we can get from uh, the you know, parks you know, yeah. department, yeah. even and the 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 best for work. And that's that is important, yeah. And because right. they need to know what's going on, yes. Absolutely. And then, do your investors work late at night to like walk people in their cars from certain industry yeah. closing that may have a bunch of tips in their pockets? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. usually like that's a really good so, so, we don't have a, we don't have limits of when we can work. I think the limit is really what you can do with your budget, okay. and, and again, I would. As you're prioritizing what you want this program to do, um, you know, it will become, it will come down to a choice of like, do I want to do that at night? Like, like do I want to deal with the bar crowd when they let out? Or do I want to make sure that, you know, the people who are having dinner at eight o'clock don't put negative reviews in, about downtown or the whole night? And so, you know, it becomes that unless you just have, you know, infinite amounts of cash. But I think you said you had to make some stretch. And so, almost the end of the decade. Yep. So I think that that's what we'll play with in terms of like where's the best thing for the buck. Um, but we don't have limitations of what time of night we can work. That's the service that like in Hollywood that I was talking about. It's rock. Well, there's some scary stuff in Hollywood. Um, and so that's a big part of what we do is like after the work shift is over, getting people back to their cars. And, and I think just to add to what Derek was saying, I think that's honestly where we want feedback from you all, you know, in, ter in terms of that, um, particularly. You know, we have our thoughts, particularly as the city side, but we want to hear from the businesses about when you think, you know, service. And Andrew, one of the things I would suggest, and this goes back to your question about efficacy and whatnot, if there's any opportunity to do a survey, perception survey in advance of any one of the services, and we get that back six months after the launch or something like that, I think that would be telling. Sure. We'll do that. Yeah. In any of your, your other cities, do you have um, where you help with accessibility as far as like people's uh, yeah, elderly or mm -hmm. can't walk really far and have different zones? You can like nice golf cart, you can see seat belts, you can jump off at different spots, take it back to cars. We do run some circulators. We actually just full uh, in Nashville, for instance. We have, uh, we operate 27 shuttle buses that service a downtown circulator and gives us a package to it. But yes, we do help with accessibility. Stuff more so, I would say the most common scenario though is just basic, like good Samaritan stuff. Uh, you know, recognizing somebody having an issue and, and helping them out. Um, you know, when it comes to you know budget and liability, this is a lot of the times people shy, shy away from like the you know putting grandma on a golf cart, but it, it can't be done. And then last. My last one was on the branding side. We found in cities where it, it looks more um, bubbly that the security still has the same level of uh, people feeling like they can get away with less. Like, doesn't like whether you look like a cop or have a fluorescent yellow shirt, does it does it have the same effect, you think, or is it really that much of a difference? Or maybe these cities are choosing that because they want that police look presence. So I think that like from a, 
general population's point of view, that's where the, the aesthetic changes perception. So if you've ever been to a city and you get out, there's a bad wagon with water, the armed security everywhere, here's the messenger said, what the hell happened here that like to warrant all of this? Yeah. It almost has an opposite effect. It doesn't make our feeling right. Um, and so, um, but to the people who see us every day, again, we're there every day and building relationships, what really makes or break our program is the amount of support we get. Like, so our goal is not to call PD for like low level quality of life stuff that we can handle ourselves. Like, hey, I know you, could you move away from the obstacle of this business to level in 30 minutes? And like, you know, you can come right over here. Um, as opposed to, you know, once they know that, it doesn't matter if we're wearing a yellow shirt or if we're wearing fatigues. Um, you know, but if we need something escalated, then we call it it's for good reason. You know, hopefully we can get the support. We're not going to call it that. We're not the boy who cried wolf. And so I think that that's the balance of people know that we have a little bit of clout that can get, you know, that's the situation that we need to. That's that's important to a program success. Was it your company that was featured on a, a PBS like half hour special? Mm -hmm. I forget what kind of what, it was a city when they had ambassador and it was a lot of things you're talking about. Okay. You had a very yellow shirt and it was awesome. Yeah. 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 My yellow shirts are good. Yeah. 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 He said he called twice in like three years of work. Right. And that was because somebody OD'd in the other time for two guys that were homeless were fighting that he didn't want to get in the middle of. Right. And now it's... Yeah, this typically was, most things could be handled in diplomatic ways. What's your approach to cities um, handling natural disasters? What happens then? So typically, um, our role in that, we work in some places like Washington, D.C., that, you know, we're probably going to never call it building triangle which is outside of the White House, which isn't a natural natural disaster or natural disaster, but certainly natural depending on what you look at it. So things can happen. We work in Los Angeles and San Francisco where they have earthquakes. Uh, and just most recently last weekend uh, when the storms came through Houston, uh, it was blowing glass out of 40 story buildings all over downtown. Um, we were there, we were actually working with that. So first and foremost, it's like safety of our employees, we're gonna let it get out of there and make sure that this is, you know, like, you know, if there's a tornado, we're not going to be storm chasing, we're going to be in the basement somewhere. But after the fact, the cleanup efforts, the assessments of buildings and safety, um, you know, we're going to be right there. We can, you know, document like, hey, the streets, that's what I saw over there's trees down here, the, the train got clogged up, and there's things like, um, what have you. Um, and then we can help uh, with even, you know, disaster planning. Uh, if you're looking for, and again, I'm not like a we're not like a safety risk assessment company, but a, you know, if you're looking for uh, basic supportive businesses of like what a you know what a triage plan could be for an emergency response plan, we can help. Does so, I answer your question. Joint City County Group Commission meeting, and, and there were some opinions about this. You were there, you know, supporting, you know, this program. Um, and there was an opinion by the county commissioner says, Oh, it's just glorified, glorified businesses. Um, it's not a good investment of money, blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So, we've got that mindset out there, sure. and clearly, if it's launched, when it's launched, we want to make sure we've got the feeling mm -hmm. and feedback, um, and that it is successful. We're doing everything on the front end to make it successful. Um, because I've seen it. I mean, I've clearly seen it. I've seen it in Jacksonville, but I saw it again in Miami and I was alive for a long time. It works. It does. It is perspective. But it's funny, there's no real case study out there that talks about this stuff about bids and this is from the districts, and you can find different information of you know, that's more about for those, but there's nothing that really speaks to ambassador programs. It's been like Written by but let me just say this. So I'm, I'm, I'm confident that I was born and raised in East Palapa, okay. but I spent all my adult life in Miami. Right. So I'm used to being hyped. I'm used to, you know, sure. right. I come to Gainesville and that hype, quite frankly, was different. I mean, even. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I don't like it. I like the coolness. That's why I came right. back. I like to, you know, be a little more country. Right. But, but when we hire people, they really have to be on it. Um, they can't be all cool and, you know, it's okay. And, you know, they need to feel like they're engaged. The people that you hire, they're engaged every day. Sure. Uh, and so 
when I went to Miami, that's what I saw. Again, I mean, it's the passion. It's the motivation. This is why I'm here and I'm doing it. And I like doing it. Um, but I see a lot, unfortunately, mm -hmm. in Gainesville. That attitude is not there. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, and, and so I would hope that this, you know, is going to show some some engagement every day. And, and some workers are certainly more challenging. One of the things that, you know, because we work in so many places, you kind of see visually like the shifts and, you know, people's swag and what makes them excited and what motivates them. So, you know, I live in a community that's not the most motivated. It's like global, it's like one of the hardest places to recruit. It really is. We're paying like these really good wages, like, and it doesn't like it's still going up there, you know. So I, I, I feel like we're, we're paying this sex so we we'll to work uh, to make sure that uh, they're sitting the right people. Yeah, and I, I guess around that, I'd ask, you know, one of the things I got in our meeting with the, the police chief and fire chief when we spoke to them that, you know, and correct me if this is wrong, but one of the biggest things that I heard from Chief Loyo was that not that we don't have enough enforcement, it's we just can't recruit enough people to get people in there to do that. And, yeah, I do. I do worry, or I guess I'm curious what we're looking at when you when you decide what to pay people for this position to make sure that we're getting people that are going to be, you know, for paying minimum wage, we can have zero expectations of that person. But if we're paying, you know, real wages for somebody to be down there and help people, right. it might actually take it as a much more serious yeah. responsibility. And, and I agree with that. Um, and thankfully, um, our jobs where we're offer people is not the same as law enforcement. It's like unbelievable scrutiny on the PD side and like it's just a tough market to try to recruit that one on one. Mm -hmm. So but um 85%, 80, 80, 80, 85% of your program's budget will be employee cost, will be wages, benefits, uh things like that. We try to offer better benefits than a lot of like security or janitorial providers. Uh and the pay certainly I think in the one of the biggest shifts we've had in our organization since the pandemic is how much we've started paying people. And so I would look at this program uh, for any less than 20 bucks an hour. Okay. Out to do you utilize the community to give referrals for those interviews? And I think that's that too. That's an system. So uh, we'll create referral bonuses for our teams. Uh, once they're on, they you know, recruit people. Um, you know, I know, I've had a couple of people that are very aggressive recruiters in the community and with you know, other families and they paid them out an extra five grand over the course of a year or something like that for that. So absolutely. In the, in the college towns that you serve, do you find a mix of your masters between college students and townies? I do, especially like on the safety hospitality front. College students, they don't like to clean as much. Mm -hmm. uh, they do like it. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 So, uh, we'll clean up. We yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but we do want to, I think it'd be a uh, huge opportunity missed if we didn't engage with the rest of some level. Uh, of this program, you know, if they have to do a criminal justice program or mm -hmm. you know, a, you know, a, a city planning type thing, they just want to learn more about, like, you know, space management. Um, but I would anticipate not having like a whole team of college students. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Oh, no, you can't yeah. do that. And there is Santa Fe, which has a footprint downtown. Right. Very soon as well. and, and Santa Fe does have a, a public safety uh, institute. Too, yeah. Really. Right. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll buy Grace Murray. So, okay. If the public fluid is a contract with the city, so, like we, we, we don't like that part of the I'm so that up. I hate very rigid contract language. I like scope. It gives us a little breathing room on all sides because again, we're in public space and it's like not defined like that. Like and so um, you know, our standard contract language is pretty general about terms like, you know, we want you to be friendly and have good reporting and like, you know, be able to work with you know these groups of people. Um, but it's not down to the letter like you will patrol past this business five times over the course of a shift and like no. More times like your services. We oh, did yeah, it no. like for late night when you decided to leave late night. Absolutely. For three months. We just take that off. You didn't want to do anymore. You want it all cleaning and then figure okay. it out. So. 
Yeah. 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 No, I'm just kind of wondering yeah. how. This is, like, this is a scoping kind of right. a meeting for us to figure yeah. out what the specs look like and so right. we're listening to you. Well, think of the team which you have in this size of a city or this area. I mean, if we were going right. all out for like both specifically downtown, what is like top level where you know this is going to be the most polished, awesome downtown you've ever seen? So I haven't seen all of the downtown you have experienced at, at all times of day. So it's hard for me to answer without full assessment, but like, you know, I think that like, depending on the, we haven't even defined the footprint here, they're talking about downtown or going over to you know, midtown, which I think would make a huge difference. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that a good way to look at this is whatever time and day that we've identified is like, this is where you're gonna get the most bang for the buck, create sizable zones where there, you can kind of get around them. You don't want like mega zones with 30 blocks of these and one person's out there like never getting, they're never completing the map, right? Um, and so, like, the ideally, you want somebody to have like you know six to eight blocks that they're responsible for, um, and then they can interact with the businesses, they can you know interact with the pedestrians, they can get to know the population. Uh, you can even put that to the you know well, I mean, there's no really prescribed area, uh, you know, with that, but you want it to be managed. So you still didn't give us the number, but you don't I, I don't know. But, yeah. but do you have yet the footprint to tell you how much retail, how much, how many restaurants, how many do, have we given them that yet? We've given them the uh, what we call the core area, which is if you look at the downtown strategic plan, it's the Red Cross in the middle of the downtown study area. It goes all the way from Depot Park up to Eighth Avenue. Do we know how many businesses are in that that that, that footprint? And how many people, uh, residences? I mean, I don't know. We just we know what those demographics. Yeah, we know what the larger downtown study area is in terms of population, but we don't have that carved out. Okay. So you, you know. mm -hmm. I mean, I can well program the Netness and we know all the nuances of like, you know, that modeling because it really is about, I keep it simple, like, so from like 7 a.m., I was out this morning at 6. Um, and it was pretty quiet, but around 7.30, you know, 7, 7.30, people started kind of coming out a little bit. You can tell the coffee shops were opening and things like that. So my goal, and then there's a whole bunch more businesses that open later. So this is quite a show, right? And so there's like this. You're going to need a whole training to convince, to figure out when certain restaurants are open here. Right. right. Uh, but, but that's kind of what I look at. It's like, when are people, when are the businesses open and expect? maintain the streets. You don't want to come in and immediately, first thing you got to do every morning is fight with somebody who's like in, in the alley behind your business or something like that. And so mm -hmm. we like to deploy an hour or two before, you know, the activity starts to happen so we can kind of start like making sure that it's yeah. managed well. Um, but I think from a budget, from kind of like an area perspective, at least how I'm seeing this or it sounds like there is potential options for, you know, Midtown, and I understand that value, but I think to me, I would want to see this as laser, laser focused on that area of downtown that's been allocated as possible, uh, though I really think it would be an important option. It's kind of like you had mentioned with Memphis and the other larger institutions being able to tag in some extra support that, you know, if, if there was an approach with UF saying, hey, you know, we're doing this as the city, UF, would you like to contribute some extra? I don't think then that's kind of a big thing that says. Yeah, yeah, and they yeah, yeah. expanded down to Midtown. As yeah, soon it's, as it's, it's, it's a crowd too. And, and so here's what's happened in other markets. So the Knoxville, Tennessee, the University of Tennessee, that in Austin, Texas, where UT's at, and University of Minnesota, like this downtown adjacent Minneapolis, they all established programs in like the downtown core first and then approach the universities or the universities approach them, like, how do we get some of this down here? Okay. So there is like a history of that that you could. There is. Did you, did we, I don't know, I missed it because I'm sick, but then the university might pay for the universities. I don't think I don't so well, you're invited to the meeting, Jacob. <laughs> if we did go all the way to Midtown, that, that part west of Sixth Street would tap into a different funding source, so it wouldn't impact mm -hmm. downtown. 
Okay. The uh, college yeah, the university. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. That might be okay. Yeah. I I'll think it's that. worthwhile because I've heard yeah. uh, anecdotal evidence about parents being concerned about their um, and that's a little kids walking up yeah. and down University Avenue between Midtown and Downtown. There's also some Santa Fe there too that could yeah. help out with their area. Right. But you know, the innovation district, they may be curious because they have this retail lab where they're doing um, simulations of retail lab stuff on them. So they have some really cool things going on in there. So you may, you know, get some interest there. Across but let's that little place too. Yeah. We've got a start downtown. Yeah. Uh, that's my opinion. I'm so I agree. I agree. <laughs> and if we're talking about deployment and you know number of team members and things like that, one way to look at this, and I can I can tell you this that like at twenty dollars an hour, uh, with you know the the overhead that's that's in there, like safety programs will have minimal supplies, right? Bath pressure washers and cleaning supplies and things like that. I'm going to plan on around seventy five thousand dollars annually per full time employee. That includes Manager, RPs, I mean, that's all in the benefits, everything. So that's where you start looking at it. So if you have, you know, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and you're talking like, you know, that's only three or four people, like, and so like, it, it kind of scales from there. So that's one way to look at it, and I think that, that starts saying like, okay, I want fifteen ambassadors, but that's expensive. So do you see any points where where you know, maybe they start too small and it doesn't really get enough traction versus not really going too big. It's just kind and of. I, and I tell people this all the time like, if you have nothing right now doing it, you add even a little bit of services, you might have to temper your expectations around how broad you want the scope to be or how late it's going to stay. And, but you can do a lot, like a little. I, I think for our model in, in particular, um, it, it's critical to having that manager in place. So you just have to build it big enough for us to. Put our model in, uh, but beyond that, I mean, we have we work in some areas. Um, like I'll use Hollywood Beach for example. Uh, that's this really small team that we have there um, that does really good work. Less than ten. Less than ten. How far does it expand up to Garfield Beach or Garfield Street? Yeah, that's a bad I might see it there. <laughs> I don't know that I, I do. I, it's actually a little party strip. It is um, yeah. probably about twenty blocks worth from the big hotel at like Hollywood Boulevard, all the way north. Okay. Can we, we can use our out. vehicles? So can we use our vehicles you for you for your people. Right, and we could even do it like at least a sandwich. So you can throw the liability on me and all that stuff. Okay, that helps. Do we? Has, has there been any discussion about the? Well, I don't even remember what this building has ever been because I've never seen it as anything. That uh, little substation. bitty building, yeah, in County Corner to Plocos. Yeah, the substation. Substation. What yeah. about what? What, what is it? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I have no idea what's. Yeah. Oh, still Oh, look, you saw the Yeah, it's still Yeah, that's kind of what I'm going to do. Yeah. 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 Have trainings and meetings, and uh, uh, that might be too small. So, yeah, the county, the county, the county did renovate right it maybe, maybe two or three years ago, and it was, it was nice inside, but it is a small. It would be like a yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's like a point of contact, especially for like hey, it's raining. We're, we're out in the streets most of the time. I mean, if we're all in the office all the time. It's a program. Usually it's like eight hours, you know. But I've been playing with like this is again the fact that culture I've been playing with 10 hour shifts that the program times support it. Um, because I think people really love having three days off. I really would be time trying to like revitalize our image and make it seem safer. I think the best hours would be like five to eleven. And that's kind of a little bit before would be nice if there's like a cleanup. Yeah, maybe like being there for anyone coming from a different side of town. Those would be the hours. That the, the other question I have for you guys too, um, like right now, I understand it's kind of the slow season because of school's out for the summer. And so another way to stretch the budget out is maybe look at the seasonality um, to 
almost ramped the program down a bit, not a ton, but a bit in the summer months. I don't know if, from an operator standpoint, if that's a good idea or not, but if you could have more, put more boots in the ground, like during the, the volume months, is that, is that you worried about losing good employees if they can't get the full time? Sometimes it's a good opportunity to get rid of balance. Okay. <laughs> do, you, do you have um, people that are like retired and they just no. love their community no. and they, they're super stoked that they can get paid now? Favorite. They're like, I think we probably would have so it's many. My favorite. Like that. That's, what I, that's what I'm thinking there. I'm already getting phone calls. That's my favorite. Yeah, I want to be tired to do this, but I can't do that. <laughs> um, you ever have corporate sponsors that help to pay for, say, that one ambassador. So one time, yeah, we have, and like, so surprisingly, this has not been utilized as much as I would think it has. But and I can go, it's kind of strange sometimes that we had done this program in Jackson Heights, New York City, where this dentist sponsored and he wanted to sponsor the uniforms. And so it's a very small organization, not like sure. Uh, but all of our people were walking around with this giant molar on each one of their arms. It was like the branding was just kind of like, yeah. you know, they abandoned that pretty quick. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, it, it, but it could be done. I think that like in this climate, like, you know, since the pandemic, I mean, property values are getting reassessed and there's less downtown workers and things like that. And so corporate sponsorship is becoming um, kind of a, a conversation piece. Do you, do you see, um, I guess, all Further evidence of like tag along investment after this, or you know, the biggest thing we're kind of looking at downtown is you know vacancies, and now we're now we're seeing more vacancies, and you know, this is something we're hoping to address kind of long term. Is that you know the perception of safety, the improvement of parking is going to continue to reattract businesses, um, and you know, how much are you seeing? Because people coming in afterwards and being like, wow, this looks really great. Let's open up new stuff. Um, here's what I can say. The clean and safe is always better than dirty and dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that the past three or four years is still very hard to engage, like uh, to gauge what, what's working, what's not. There's been so much, you know, we're going to worry about people finding this and that in terms of vacancy um, specifically. Um, but every time, if you have a foundation of clean and safe environments, and this is why bids exist in the first place, this is why HOAs exist, mm -hmm. all of these things, um, that's a much better platform to, you know, full space and have economic development in, in dirty and dangerous streets. How would, um, how much input could we as businesses have into some of the marketing around this, um, you know, one of the things that we've been working on completely separately, we have a master's student who just kind of wrote a project on how downtowns communicate via, you know, social media and stuff and made us some recommendations and started to spec out a brand and like just some things. And we'd love to be able to, you know, try and present that at some point. See what y'all think. So, okay. Okay. So that's not, that may be. Is that yeah, part of the board? Yeah. Okay. That's the yeah. question. Yeah. Cool. I think you can push thinking about something. Else. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just cool. just like any, I mean, just like the businesses that you, that you guys run, I mean, this would be an identity that we would want to co brand and that we would want you all to be pushing out Who would you know, to your patrons, yeah. you know, and have them put into that. Absolutely. Because, I mean, it, again, like this is going to be like a, um, you know, a very kind of close relationship that we see between, you know, the um, the, uh, the ambassador program and the downtown businesses. Why? And the ambassador program is the city. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so what about the garages in the downtown area and your experiences with garages in other areas? What's what's that? So, because it's part of the footprint, we do control them. Uh, we Would that be included here or not? Um, it could be. I mean, we don't really want to worry about where they control. Where they're most effective because we got several garages. It's just about again, like where you, it's about budget size and where you want people to see your, okay. your services. Uh -huh. Essentially, it. so um, you know, I used to be in the parking business, and so I know the, the, what parking can do to make and break people's experience with the place. Um, so it's important. It's important. Yeah, so we have to identify that. Yeah, that's that's kind of our, our big complaints or a lot of you know that we hear 
constantly from West Gainesville is, you know, oh, I never know where to park and it's terrifying. But, you know, the parking is a big thing. Like, the parking, like, if you ask anybody what they don't like about downtown, it's always about parking. And all. That's really, yeah, is what they say, like, nine out of ten communities across the United States. Yeah. So you guys have a lot of work. I know you guys have a lot of well. Just not right and wrong. It, it's confusing. It's confusing too. You know, I mean, I tried to. I live three blocks away and having to transition to driving because broke my shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I got confused. I got I got booted. Did I, you? Yeah. Did you watch yeah. <laughs> Is that how you heard your side? Yeah, I totally. I, I locked him because I was like going to be there for five minutes wow. and he came back and was like, well, Okay, I should be hiring you for my business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got locked in. Um, yeah, but you know, it, it happened, but yeah, it's still like all of those, like, you never really know where you're kind of parking. And so, I mean, I think the, you know, the help and guidance for people out of a program like this is really valuable. A question of uh, you all, when do you think the most important days of operation would be? Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, graduation weekend. Yeah, yeah. Game day weekends. Uh, I think like Saturday evenings. It's just it'd be nice too if you could hold businesses responsible a little bit too. Some don't clean up all their or stuff. Stuff. Mm -hmm. stuff. We say, hey, we've been here cleaning up your stuff every morning. You need to. I don't know if that's like a. Mm -hmm. you know, that's just that I mean, this every day, not yeah. leaving it to wherever it does. That's where like the technology tool can come in. We can report on anything that we that you know before that you're gonna form games and that's nice. If you have your teams do 12 hour days over these peak hours, I'd probably divide that up and shit for it. Because then if you have somebody call in, that's like a big chunk of time that like you're not filling. Uh, it's 12 hours. Yeah, I like to have shifts, but I can play up to deployment. I thought a lot of people, I mean, so I got out on Wednesday night. There seems to be a lot of people out last night, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like a Wednesday through Sunday type of vibe, or it's, it's college kids. Let's go out every night of the week. It's older. Yeah. I mean, there's like so I went to Dragonfly for dinner, and it was busy. Mm. Stopping tops for a drink, busy with death metal, plaza, busy. I got it or something. Lucy's at Shell. Yeah, maybe it was Lucy. But it was early. I was tripping out because it was over early in the night. That's fair. It was daylight when they started. Yeah, it was cool. And somebody came over and they're like, I was going to have a burger at Lucy's, but it's too loud. So I got there was several, just like the crowd was funny. It was sitting up like into that band. They were going happy. Our town has a lot of Alaska County residents. Okay. They can totally. Wednesday's gonna be totally dead too. Again, yeah, just sort of yesterday it was. Well, so yeah, the top of the dragon fire usually always is. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like, um, yeah, I think the weekends, but just maybe less hours during Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Is there any for daytime deployment, like early morning? I think that's rush. Saturday morning, like kind of making it look good for Saturday and yeah. day and evening. Potentially also then Sunday. Just since there's people at the end of the night, they have, um, you know, they'll throw their cup. Yeah. And so if it looks good in the morning for people that are running around downtown or going to brunch downtown, hopefully what yeah. would happen is that we would need another day because downtown is so, so. pedestrian yeah. friendly that people want to be there. And we get some other businesses, and they're like, after a year or two years, we're like, all right, let's Wednesday is not huge, let's do, and we expand. What is the, uh, so you guys just mentioned cleanup efforts a couple of times. In your estimation, is that just as important as like the public safety outreach piece? I think it's that uh, works together. If it looks crappy, it feels, yeah, yeah. that's good. Now, let me ask. It's, so one of the things we learned in our in our downtown kind of cleanup we did recently was that Keep Alaska County Beautiful does 
what, 15 cleanups a month or something like that downtown that we don't know about? The, or they can do that and may or may not have people to execute on it. And with those cleanups, are there any options? I'd, I'd say, are there any options to work with those organizations or you know, doing doing those kind of things to help guide them and say, oh, okay, here's stuff that needs to be done. Okay. I need to get to know them a little bit better and learn more about it. But absolutely, if there's volunteer efforts going on or other efforts, we want to learn about that and see how we can. I mean, get all the things. It's gross, but if there was like a mobile pressure washing unit yeah. after in the morning, just to, for all the amateur yeah. hour people. We we do um, we do I think you guys may or may not be aware like we do have a dedicated public works crew that does clean up. I mean, they do more than just clean up. They have like they we just got a pressure washing rig I think a couple of uh, maybe about a month ago or so. Um, so we and then we have the city has a separate contract on the weekends. Mm -hmm. So they come out every day, or they come out like they're, they're, morning, they're, they're, just, they're just downtown. Yeah, yeah. They, they have a weekend contract as well. Okay, cool. Yeah. I know they were doing the whole sidewalk. Sometimes it's just you need about this much square footage for it. Yeah. No, I I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. I think I don't know if they're doing uh sort of uh taking like chunks and doing like about having a pressure washing schedule and I mean it's out of our public works and um, he's somebody that I would want you to talk to you know, yeah. just a zoom call or I mean, the same with Brian Singleton we can reach out to that right uh, so so that would be something that we could uh, as we said like kind of coordinate on the uh Upside. Yeah, because they can maybe just document at night if it's if it's geo hit and they're like, okay, we're gonna go. We got vomit spots to get in the morning. Right. Um uh, I think Derek can ask this like in the in the mornings, like well, I think we've gotten new complaints in the past about property owners, business owners, and having to you know, kind of get people up, um, you know, moving. Is that something that we should consider in terms of uh, you know hours? Meaning a sleeper. Like, yeah, people are camping out oh. uh, in alcoves or communities or whether it's I mean, I don't know whether it's specific morning, just specific morning, or just even just doing that in general. So like this morning when I was I was out at 6 a.m. ish, um, and there were several, there's like Kind of sporadic, but there was several people sleeping in various places. And so my question was that, that I wasn't still in downtown when people started waking up, and like our business is trying to open, and there's people sleeping in their doors or in their patios. We we've definitely heard that. We we get complaints about that. Yeah, yeah I mean, the hotel I stayed there, I stayed in Hyatt, and. Usually this is only reserved for like big cities with big problems. Like you can't get in that building or up anything without using your hotel key, which tells me that they're very concerned with people going upstairs. Yeah. That checks out. I mean, it's it's nice it's nice it's nice it's yeah, I guess I'm sort of balancing the sort of balancing, I guess, the the morning style businesses that right now. One of the things I think we're hoping to build with downtown is more businesses that might be open in the morning and during the day and transition. You know, I'm not really, I guess I'm not really sure how to weigh that is whether there are people that just have vacant properties that you walk by that you're like, oh, I'm not going to, why would I rent this? Right. You know, because there's looks like somebody sleeps here all the time, even though it'd be an awesome breakfast restaurant or something. Well, Starbucks and Mods used to be a real encampment earlier this year. Yeah, it was, wasn't an issue today, but it's it's more like whack a mole. No, it doesn't seem more like that. Whether it's like big camps, it has been moving around a little bit since Lynch yeah. Park and Fort Five got. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I guess I'd also ask: Is this something that would extend into you know, the, the, like the Sun Center? Because I mean, I know that's something they would care about. That I don't know the Sun Center's. It's private oh, property, right? right? Yeah, yeah. Um, just because it is. Okay. The land around the hippodrome is public. 
Sun Center is private. It's the yeah, it goes all the way to the train. Yeah, there's a small section of public that's like right, you know, uh, kind of close to the um, well, close to the Palomino, you know, the, uh, or our back, but the rest of it's all private. And the whole kind of like U shape is all private. It goes to the steps in the back of the train. Yeah, I feel like those, I mean, that's, you know, people who would really be concerned about their, you know, and have been very concerned about the populations coming through and staying yeah, there. Yeah. Have you guys already seen the shift into seasonal hours for your businesses? Jake, are you consistent all year? Are you scaled back for summer? We can't afford to scale back. So, okay. Okay. We're actually going to be launching like more. Opportunities. We're going to be shifting to probably do uh, breakfast. Also, oh, yeah, and okay. you know, a Sunday brunch. Weird, weird food. Right. Any of the pop ups are. Okay. Yeah. Hey, you, you mentioned the house list, and you mentioned being out at six a.m. And I'm driving through downtown every day around six to seven a.m. And I definitely noticed. Um, much more spread out of the house lists where they're sleeping. Um, I've noticed in general, a lot of them sleep at Bodidly. And then so I say, it's some people in their cars. So that means there's like almost like a working house in the population. So, so, yeah. so sleeping at Bodidly, um, sleeping in front of the library, yes. sleeping in front of the, uh, there's some there's, there's traffic, but there's like court services right at that corner okay. of the county building also. And so I think from what I see, I think a lot of them are avoiding sleeping in front of businesses per se, because they know they're going to get asked to move. And so I think that's probably playing into where they're actually trying to fall asleep in the first place. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess and how, how can we communicate? I guess I have questions around this, like how can we communicate, you know, say this is a program we're going. I mean, we're, we're, as an organization, we've got a couple little messages about, you know, Lynch Park closing. Um, so I'm curious, how, how do we communicate this to other people that may say, you know, hey, it's completely inhumane to move somebody, wake them up at 6 a.m. and kick them out of this business when, where else are they going to go? Um, how do, yeah, how, how have, you know, really curious marketing guidance or how you guys have handled so that? You know, you always want to have an alternative for somebody because, again, the, there does need a place to go where, like, hey, you can go over here and people aren't going to care as much. Um, it would just be about identifying those areas, um, working it through uh, the actual ambassadors or whether it's through the programs the fire department does or, or whatnot, and not marketing it at all, actually, the, like the, the displacement. Plan, if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know that I would put that on a piece of collateral. Yeah, no, yeah, I, yeah, I understand that part, but you know, especially in messaging, I mean, those questions are going to come up here. So, I think if you have a plan for people, if you're not trying to criminalize things that aren't illegal. Yeah. And if we have a bed available for them. This one, yeah. I would say too, which is great, is the, the fire department program, and they have. Uh, 10 shelter beds and they're getting ready to get 10 more yeah. a, that they can assign to directly. Cool. And so that's what I was talking about, like working within like the, the existing structures. And, you know, they might not be downtown every day, every hour, but, you know, we can be, we can advocate for that and you know, we have enough clout. If we call it like, hey, I finally have this person that's ready to go to shelter, then we'll have access to that, would be my hope. Would your local manager be able to come to like our downtown business group meetings? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They're going to say your bar while he was working or she was working. I was like, I don't know how about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll probably want them to come to the downtown advisory board as well. For, for I think, thing. Yeah, we report it out with like, you know, the stats uh, that we've identified and really the story, the messaging behind the stats, like, you know, what do these mean? Like, um, it's funny, public spaces or public safety is like the topic of the shore mm -hmm. across all these communities. And so the transit systems play, I guess. I'm doing a pilot program in Mile City now where we're putting safety ambassadors on the problematic bus lines. And the information that we're getting out is like static reporting, like, okay, I don't this many people out, or like, you know, there's this many variation attempts 
but there wasn't any kind of story there to to kind of augment that like that and so we just changed the way we reported and it changed the level of support for the program because hmm. instead of static numbers it was like and then you know that prevented this person from getting assaulted kind of like digging into like the, the cause and effect of things hmm. helps and so i would look for those opportunities to kind of animate the, our experiences on the street a little bit here okay well that's really that'll be really helpful well, yeah, I don't know. I think I, I mean, I gotta go back somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been a great meeting. I think we all learned a lot. I really appreciate you coming down. Really appreciate you including us in your on this conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, my first first pass on it sounds like this is you know right in what we've been looking for and what I think a lot of people have been asking of either the city or go downtown and. You know, who knows how people are going to respond to, I mean, you know how people respond to things, you never really know, but like, there's, this sounds like a thing that people consistently say they want. Yeah, I think our goal, you know, kind of leading from here is to, um, to really kind of, uh, you know, work with Derek and to get sort of, you know, taking everybody's feedback um, to get a scope, you know, sort of. Uh, ironed out, and then I think our we'll come back and kind of um, you know uh, talk to you all again. Look right, look like kind of what we talked about. Um, is there anything we're missing? Um, and then moving on to uh, on to the city commission. Uh, cool. you know, get get the ball rolling. So. Great, yeah, sounds cool. Happy to, happy to help how we can. You know, I mean this. Cool. If anybody has questions in the meantime, I didn't. So, funny, so my bag jumped out of my car on the way to the airport, and all my business cards went with it, I think. But um, um, I can, if you wanted to circle like, my information to sure. anybody, yeah. if, like, if you're offline with additional questions or whatever, I'd be happy to Great. engage. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thanks for <laughs> 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 